Okay, welcome to another episode of the Launch School Podcast. Today we have Missy Lovegren, who is a software engineer at New Relic. And uh, how's it going, Missy? Thanks for stopping by. Hey, absolutely. Happy to be here. And you work on the engineering operations team, which we'll talk yep. about more later on like what that is. Um, but to get started, maybe just like maybe a quick intro, your your spiel, <laughs> your background. Um you know, what, what, what you graduated college with and how you ended up in programming. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm Mitzi. I am based in Austin, Texas, and I graduated here from UT with a bachelor in studio art. Um, and so I have kind of a meandering path to eventually software engineering, much school, but I, I got an art degree, and during school, I became a student graphic designer. I just kind of fell into it as like a way to earn extra money, and because it seemed like a fun internship. And then I stayed on after graduating for a couple of years. Um, but then my partner had to move to the um, D.C., Virginia, Maryland area for work, and I moved with him. And so that kind of started me on a series of not odd jobs, but just different short, trying out different things short term that were sort of tangentially related to fine arts. But, um, so you're just like trying like, to pursue art, do we? And like timeline wise, well, how many bit. years ago was this? Just kind of like, so I roughly have an idea. Yeah. Yeah. So I graduated college, uh, in 2017 and then we moved in 2019 and then so i i wrote all this down because i always forget my timeline but um i ended up starting launch school in 2021 so it was about two years yeah not too not too long uh, yeah it wasn't it wasn't too much but it was enough time so i was a um i was a graphic de- graphic designer project manager kind of rolled into one for this very small editorial project i did some illustration work um i ended up becoming a landscape designer for a year and so i was kind of just bouncing around like sort of trying to pursue fine arts but none of those things were really fine arts they're just actual jobs with openings um i mean to be a fine artist you kind of have to start a small business really and i wasn't in the end, willing to yeah, do I that. mean that's that that's that you know people starving artists, right? Um, that's yeah. that's the, you're living <laughs> that life. Yeah, stereotype stereotype life. life. <laughs> yeah, no one ever says like starving software engineer, right? <laughs> no, yeah, you don't hear that adjective stuff. doesn't <laughs> doesn't go with it. <laughs> go with the profession, it's... but with artists, it does. Um, yeah. uh, so you're doing all this stuff. Like what what piqued your interest about? software engineering was it just like hey i noticed a bunch of high salaries over here or or what no so um i joke people i mean it's not a joke it's it's true but like i didn't develop an interest in software engineering until i was in launch school Hmm. so what happened is that as i'm going through this series of short-lived jobs and they're all low paying and exhausting and like not really they're all dead ends is what it felt like to me so as i'm going through this uh naturally i complain to friends and family and my partner and a couple of those people which are my um my then boyfriend steven and my friend nick they'd like kind of joke around with me here and there and be like and they're both in tech uh one's a data scientist one's a software engineer and so they'd just joke around with me and be like, you should just learn how to code. Like, your life will be so much easier. Um, you coded up your portfolio site, like, to be cheap. I just didn't want to pay for, what is it? Uh, I forget the site. It's a good reason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you coded up your portfolio. I had taken, I had audited a discrete math class in college, like, for fun. Because I wow. just needed something to balance all the subjectivity and like a weed out course usually (laughs) (laughs) Uh, i i I didn't finish it but like the bit i did take i really really liked and ended up being very helpful for programming because it's got all the logic right Mm -hmm. um 
So yeah, they they just so they like, just recognize you that can about obviously you. They're do like, this. yeah, you're you're they're just they're software it. engineers, or or your your boyfriend was my and friend, your friend, yeah, and was just like you you can obviously do this if you want to. And are you are you tired of uh, yeah, you, you know, trying to save save coupons? Um, is, is that kind of <laughs> yeah. kind of like their mentality towards you? Basically, yeah, and and of course they're both like really enthusiastic, and not of course, but in this case they're both really enthusiastic about the field too. So they're right. like, you could earn money, and it's really awesome. You should work in tech. Yeah, I think I think the, um, the, the, all the best programs I know are not. I know a lot of people are career transitioning into tech and not, and, you, you know, not like passionate about it per se, but it's it's good enough to work, and I'm totally cool with that. But um, you know, I entered the field early, <laughs> like twenty years ago, and yeah. m- most of the very seasoned people I know are, are are very passionate about the industry and field, and um, and so there's a evangelism aspect to it. That, that, yeah, that's what happens. People are excited <laughs> about what they do, right? Yeah. That's exactly what happened. I mean, and for a long time, I did not take them seriously. I was like, "This not me. This is a joke." Mm-hmm. And the conversations just kept happening, and I just kept feeling more and more frustrated. So after a while, Stephen, now my husband, um, he was like, hey, can I start looking into, like, boot camps for you? Like, maybe that's an option. I was like, okay. Like, I didn't do any of the work. He was just looking. Um, So he found this boot camp in the D.C. area. And I mean, even without knowing anything about the industry, I kind of... I kind of thought, like, really? That's just too good to be true. That's a little scary. Like, spend 16 weeks and then become a software engineer. So, ultimately, he found a not-so-savory review on this boot camp mm. online. And then I think in the same forum, someone suggested launch school. Just randomly. And then, he, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, it was on the topic of boot camps. Right, right. But I'm so, just like, he came across launch school just a little... little Haphazardly. Yeah. 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 Um, just not looking for mastery, mm-hmm. not looking for long term. Um, but then he he read your whole website and he was like, Oh, this seems really good. And then he sent it to me, and then we both read it and we talked about it for a while. And I was really my interest was very piqued by the style of your marketing, which is almost like not marketing in a way (laughs) like the lack of marketing i guess and just the realism of it too the messages are like this is going to take a long time a lot of you know you have to slog through the boredom and yeah if you want to get good at anything right (laughs) yeah it's not like you want to get at anything it's not even about coding absolutely Yeah. yeah another thing i say to people is like I, I joke around if I'd found launch school, but it wasn't for software engineering. It was like a mastery based program for classical guitar. Like I probably still would have joined it because I was still I was just so enamored by the concept of mastery based learning. I think it a lot of people have this experience, especially if you've developed a um some sort of skill. Like so for me, drawing and painting and, and making artwork. Mm-hmm you recognize your past experience and you're like, oh, that's why I have this thing in my life that's so fulfilling and that, you know, it's like, I'm good at this thing. I'm good at this thing, but it took a very, very long time and I can't seem to get good at other things because um, I'm not putting in the same time. So it's like that, the, all the messaging from launch school was lining up with my past experience. And I'm like, oh, this feels like the real deal. Like, this doesn't feel like a scam, you know? Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, students come in to launch school with a mandate for, for us, right? To say, hey, prepare me for a job that, you know, we're, we're going to go compete for jobs that pay around six figures. And all of a sudden it's like, mm-hmm. okay, that, if that's the mandate, I have, a, I have a curriculum for you. But if the mandate is different, if it's just like, you want to have a good time. That's a different curriculum, right? (laughs) So, I mean, we've gone down this road and just kind of listened to, 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 you know, the people who come to us and all of a sudden we have this curriculum that's rigorous and, um, and now people are like, oh, it's rigorous. Like, yeah, you have to give us some, right? You have to give that that demand (laughs) or you have to, we can make it fun too. (laughs) 
<laughs> but yeah, it, it's not going to be uh, results driven as much, right? So, um, so that yeah, resonated I mean, with you. I don't mean to. Absolutely, yeah. That that totally drew me in. Um, and so I started the prep course. Um, and I spent, I think the prep course took me two or three weeks. And it's, it's crazy because I do remember you going through and we actually ended up having you be a TA at some point because you, you just had an affinity for technical concepts or programming. Like you said, you audited that discrete math course, which usually is a, is a tough course that people are trying to avoid. And it seems like you just like this type of, uh, this type of work. Yeah. I mean, I have I have a lot of feelings around around the sentiment of of like saying someone has an affinity or a talent for something. Um, I've been told many times in my life that I'm a talented artist, and I kind of prickle or bristle against it because I'm like I maybe I'm talented, but when people hear the word talented, they think of like a God given gift. But really, I just like it's either it's binary, right? Painting. So you're LeBron James or you're not. Yeah. So you're LeBron James of artists. You're like, no, actually, I work. <laughs> right. Yeah. And LeBron James worked hard too, by the way. So. <laughs> Absolutely, or like Mozart. Like yeah. I don't think Mozart was also trained from a very very young age, and I am not the a Mozart. I don't want to compare myself <laughs> to LeBron James or Mozart. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I guess that the reason I bring this up is because. I had a lot of feelings around being like, oh, b because my identity until then had been like, I'm a talented artist. I have an affinity for art. So like, sure, like I liked math and and I I wasn't bad at it. And then whether or not you need to be good at math to be a programmer is a totally different, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, misconception. But um, yeah, I I guess it took me a lot of mental struggle to realize i don't just i don't need to fall into the camp of being like a right brain person or a left brain person or like i'm not just a creative person that doesn't mean i can't do ten technical things because ultimately it's just you just put in the work and you can do it like yeah. if you have the desire that's that's pretty much yeah absolutely absolutely like maybe there's some other there's some other requirements but I don't want people to walk away from this podcast being like, oh, if I, I don't have that affinity. Right. I absolutely agree with you. That's the one thing I've noticed, you know, having done this for many, many years and hundreds, maybe thousands of students, it's it's effort, right? Effort put into work. Um, but let's get back to your experience. So you yeah. went through core, went through capstone. Um, y you know, any major thoughts, any tips, advice? For people, I think most listeners are probably in core right now. Um, any 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 high level thoughts there? Yeah, um, I think when I was in core, the, the one thing that sticks out to me when I was in core, um, so I gained like the trust, especially being a little bit through. Like once I'm into core. A little bit. I'm like, okay, I thought this was the real deal at the start, and I still feel that way. I feel it more strongly. Like, I trust the program. I trust you guys. So I was very happy to like pretty much follow any directive that came from launch school. And one message you see a decent amount is like, uh, don't go down too many rabbit holes. Usually, it's in the context of studying. Like, when you find a concept, I've kind of tried to stay in the curriculum to the extent that I could. Like if I went through a module and I had a question, I'd look for answers in the forums or I'd ask um I'd ask a TA or another student or go to a study session and I'd try not to like read a hundred articles about it. Um and I kind of also extended that to looking ahead, like to the job hunt or to capstone or to being a software engineer like i i really just took this and part of it is because i didn't want to think about those things like i just i had so many failed job hunt attempts before this hmm. never able to look for a job that i was qualified for uh prior to to the job hunt after capstone so i didn't want to do that and 
I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I kind of kept my head down and I just focused on the curriculum and I tried to sort of be in a bubble and not really look at job postings or or try to yeah. get a sense of how the market was or anything. And I think that served me well. Um, I think it prevented a lot of fear and anxiety and a lot of thought spiraling. Yeah, I um, man, that's the major thing. I feel like my job description, frankly, is managing anxiety, I think. Because uh, yeah. we have everything else in place. You know, we got a curriculum, we got study groups, we, we have all the resources. Um, but what's hard to manage is everyone is so anxious all the time. And it's like, no matter how much information you give, it's the next thing. It's, there's always a gap, right? So if you say, here's the thing up ahead and paint a picture there, then it's just like, well, what about that? The, 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 the next thing. Or what if that doesn't, it's just like all the what ifs. Um, and so I, I think what you just said here is actually really important. I always say the, the verb besides study, obviously you have to study, but it's like focus. The other verb is focus, right? You got to focus. Otherwise you, you can be studying a lot of random things. You don't need to come to launch school if you want to, if you want to study all the things, right? One of the, one of the major benefits of launch school is curation, right? Is path. And it's a proven path. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, not to say you can't explore things that you want to explore for sure. You can't. Everyone's different too. So, like, maybe for one mm -hmm, person, mm -hmm. you don't need to do something, but for someone else, you do. And this is why we're around too. You can ask, right? So, yeah. Um, focusing. Okay. So, focusing through core. Um, mm -hmm. And then, uh, do you want to touch upon the, your, your capstone experience at all or, um, or talk about that? Yeah. Can I, I just want to say one more, th another plus of yeah. focusing is you get to take advantage of the fact that going through the core curriculum is like an opportunity you'll never have again. I don't see, I don't know how I'm ever going to find the time or just the space in life to dedicate myself full time to mastery based. Well, life. now you make like, too much money. Yeah, the opportunity cost is too, <laughs> <laughs> is too high. Well, I mean, I would in a heartbeat take a sabbatical to, like to be able to do something like that to just single-mindedly focus on one thing and like I I can do mastery based learning in the confine of like an hour or two at work but nothing to the scale of core it's just and looking back on it I'm like that was an awesome experience like the just the 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 flow I mean I just talked about how learning programs boring and it's, it's a lot but it's also incredible like you, you know you have ups and downs and it's just as an adult very difficult to find an experience anything like that again so yeah i look yeah. core is a beast of a course it takes a long time but this is what i say it took me like 10 years to, to <laughs> just randomly because I, I didn't have this right like something like just randomly yeah. <laughs> run into problems bump into things and you're getting it in a couple of years, maybe less. Some people finish it in you know less than a year. So yeah, um, net net, you're just you're, you're getting a lot. <laughs> you're getting a lot. Um, and I and I do and I do think it's a it's a it's a tremendous um, opportunity to just yeah take the time to like learn things well. Yeah. Um, awesome. Okay. Next capstone. You want to touch on touch on that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. So are you thinking like my project or my overall experience? Yeah. So you participated in the May cohort from last year, 2022. Um, and then you started a job hunt um, the fall, like August, September uh, of 2022. Um, just, yeah, what was that experience like, especially Capstone? Um, my next question is actually about the job hunt, so. Okay. Um, you know, Capstone is kind of similar to what I just said about Core. It was very, very difficult. But again, it was like looking back and I'm like, oh, that's awesome. I'm never going to get that opportunity again to work with three other core educated people who are all in on a project from the very beginning. Um, so I had a I had a great time in Capstone. Like it was very demanding just in terms of time and physically and how much how much energy the brain is expending right and trying to stay disciplined like 
What was your schedule like in Capstone? Are you able to share that? Because I think there's a lot of mystery there. You know, people hear from the grapevine like 12 hours a day and the other people are like, yeah, it's not that bad. You know, it's, you don't have to do 12 hours a day. So, oh, yeah, a lot of range. I there. was very, I had a lot of fear around that uh, point because I'm someone who needs a lot of sleep. Like, I think I need 10 hours of sleep. Um, that is a lot. And <laughs> I really I just, at least do, you recognize like, that. Like for it took so long, but now that I've recognized it, I my I just my life's more enjoyable. <laughs> um and I did get those ten hours of sleep every night. So I think there was maybe one late night, but that was spent socializing with my with my group members, mm. not working. Um yeah, so I I'm a morning person, so I would try to go to bed around nine, ten o'clock. Um, and then I'd wake up, um, let's see, I'd wake up around eight <laughs> and I do my, <laughs> I do any homework I hadn't finished from the night before. And, um, and you're in central time. So capstone starts a little bit later for you. Yeah. So yeah. that was, that was nice. Yeah. So capstone calls started, um, Gosh, I can't remember. Like since 10 then. probably, because it starts at 8 <laughs> Pacific. Yeah, so it'd be yeah. 10 then. Yeah, so until 10, um, I'd catch up on anything I need to do when that was homework or like research while we were researching or my, my bit of implementing. Um, yeah, and then we'd have, we'd have however long our group calls took, depending on the phase of um, Capstone. And then... My group would take a pretty short break at that point because we had one member in London. So she was oh, six hours ahead of forgot me. forgot about that. So, yeah. Yeah. It turned to work quite well because it was sort of like she'd she'd get a start on something um, what, for what was early morning for the rest of us. And then the folks in the U.S. would kind of like... So you'd wake up with like work done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we'd we'd continue it and then we were incentivized to be like to pass on work yeah. to to communicate about it be like this is what we did this is what needs to be done and then julia would wake up in the morning and be like okay i got my list of to-dos and she'd do the same hmm. thing so it was kind of nice really i mean from okay. her perspective she was probably like yeah i was staying up way too late i heard everything but <laughs> from our perspective yeah was... hopefully she knew that we we try to tell everybody <laughs> yeah the asia asia is bad time zone because it's like 12 hours yeah. exactly europe is, yeah. is six hours from eastern so it's i'm amazed not great but well, um right. yeah go to bed like at one sure. or something um yeah so and so my group got along really well that's we good. um we had a good time like i, I think so in terms of work days you know, like eight 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 hours or did you put in more roughly like or let's do it per week roughly speaking hours per week for capstone i think it's comparable to a full-time job and like not too much more yeah and for the most part i didn't work on weekends okay that's good yeah you know i know it, it it does sound intense and the reason why it sounds intense is because sometimes you do need extra time right like if you don't know how to do something or if you need extra time to figure out we need that yeah, buffer that time but i actually aim for about 45 hours a week for of work um, mm -hmm. And we do have a lot of optional stuff. Some people view it as mandatory, but we, you know, bolded is optional. You don't have to read it. <laughs> and it's it's kind of a tricky situation because some of some of it's like really good content and maybe you should just follow it, like bookmark it, right? Read it after capstone. Or if you have time, you can read it. It's, everyone has different, you know, uh, time availability, right? Um, and so there's a lot of optional work that can expand uh, the hours, right? So sometimes an article will take an, like an hour to read. So if there's two or three of those, you know, that suddenly is, uh, is, is a lot more time in that week. So, um, yeah. And, and some of the research is like pretty open-ended, right? So it's like, you can just keep eating up hours in there if you want to. Um, yeah. 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 And I'm someone who's like pretty strict about my boundaries with work and play. Like I've got, I just got so many other things that I want to do besides my career. So if you're someone who's like going to tech meetups and you've got your podcast about 
whatever. Are you talking about me? Topic. I got my podcast. To, yeah. No, like, Chris, if you were doing Capstone, you'd probably read more of be the like six hours. than I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you got, if you got all those things. Yeah, for sure. I love that you have boundaries and uh, yeah, I think Capstone could be whatever you want. Right. But you have to at least prepare for like a, like a full-time job, right? 40, 45 hours. Oh yeah. Week. Yeah. I just think that's the minimum. But if you want to expand, you can, but it's unnecessary. It's not, not mandatory. Right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, so you had a good project, finish that off. Do you want to talk about what your project was at all or, or. Yeah. Uh, we made a preview app solution. Hmm. So in a nutshell, it's, um, the audience is front end developers. And so it's a, just like a little, um, I don't know, plug in. Do you still remember it? Well, uh, very, very vaguely. <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a minute, right? <laughs> but uh, basically what it does is it spins up like a kind of mini ephemeral version of your app so that you can test out your changes in an isolated environment. And like your colleague can also do the same thing. They have their own version. So you guys don't need to worry about collisions in your code. Um, yeah, super cool. And, and it, it, it's yeah, keyed off yeah. of a pull request, right? Um, mm mm-hmm. So on GitHub, you do a pull request. It's like, I added a new feature, check it out. Because without this feature, what you have to do is like, if I'm your colleague, I have to pull down your code, get it running. But I might be in the middle of like some work. And Mm -hmm. I I don't want to like stop my work, pull down your code. And there could be like database changes that I have to, you know, make on my own local machine. I don't want to do that. Just to check out the feature, right? Check out like the the form that you built or something like that. So this, this thing will spin up an entire app provision the, uh, a server, the resources deploy your app yeah. on it. And then you, and then one click, one click, you can go see it. Yeah, right. And, exactly. and, and that app is pertains just to that pull request. It's not anything else. And if I, if you yeah. do another pull request, like there'll be another app that spins up. Right. So yeah. that super, super cool feature, super useful. And, um, yeah, I have texted my group members before and been like, man, I could really use Bubble right now. Like, yeah. I'm dealing with the nastiest merge conflicts. You mean a new relic at work? Yeah, oh, yeah. Man, yeah. Exactly. Um, that's so that's been cool. Like, I've now seen, I'm like, oh, I, I'm I'm in the use case. The use case is happening to me. <laughs> this is so exciting. No, imagine if somebody really came to you and was like, Missy, I need a job and I built this. You'd be like, what? I'm going to talk to you at least, right? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So, okay. Uh, This transitions nicely to the job hunt. So, uh, what was your job hunt like? Did did Bubble help at all in the job hunt in terms of, like, getting people to notice you or during interviews or, you know, how was was your job hunt and how did the project impact it at all, if at all? Yeah. So... I had a couple of leads that um, so I had one lead from the research phase. So I got really into one idea and I got to know a person, <laughs> at the CEO of his startup, like not personally, but I knew the things he did and watched like presentations he gave at conferences five years ago. And so I emailed him um, and he responded to me and I actually ended up doing like, I think I ended up like getting up to an HR screen that didn't go anywhere. And then I had another lead from Bubble directly. Um, and that ended up being just like an informational interview with someone who was in the space of like, he worked on something called front end application bundles. And we were inspired by that for a good while. Um, so those were a couple of leads other than that, uh, well, it was just helpful to be able to talk of something of substance in my interviews. And um, Neuralic doesn't, there wasn't really any overlap there with uh, preview apps or ephemeral app. Um, so, yeah, the job. I, I think I underestimated how psychologically difficult it would be. Yeah. Emotional, <laughs> like I, psychological. Yeah. Like in my head, I was like, okay, I'll do capstone. And then 
my once capstone is done, my job will just be a job, and I'll just it'll just be like forty hours, and or it ends up whatever. We won't talk about the hours, but I'm like, I'll just compartmentalize everything I was doing in the hours of capstone. That'll be my job hunt. Like I'll do it from morning till late afternoon. That'll be done. It'll just be like normal life, and eventually I'll get a job. But um, there's just so many opportunities you just become addicted to like refreshing your email to see if people respond to you and there's like at every turn there's an opportunity for uh, for hope and then your hope getting crashed down is just it, it just was yeah it's terrible it's, it's like any job any job hunt um it's like emotional and, uh, abuse right and they they come in with like you you should know our company you should have read about it you should be excited to like why do you want to live work here and you, you have to have a good answer and you have to like at least learn a little, little bit about it and then you yeah get, you get rejected and um what i see is people just get knocked out emotionally for a couple days right mm -hmm. so you 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 have your workload for the week and then all of a sudden one rejection just sets you back uh you know two two days uh it, it's not uncommon I think what what helped over and over again was just hearing like it's a numbers game. It's a number game. Like you just got to put in the numbers, and then you, you can't get disappointed about like five applications that, yeah. that didn't go through. You can start making changes once you've applied to like I don't know what you recommend now, but it was like it's more now. At least yeah, hundred. <laughs> yeah, we, we'll um, we won't record it just because it might change. <laughs> but by, yeah. by the time whoever's listening to this, you know we. The guidance might change, and but we've we've just in the last six months we've upped it since since when you were doing a job hunt last year. Yeah, I could see that. But the point being, like, you have to wait until a metric has been like you set a metric, and then once you exceed that metric, based on how the market's doing, then you then you fine tune, and hopefully you don't ever like get discouraged. I mean, of course you will, but. The point being, like, I guess it's adjusting expectations. Yeah. Especially if people are coming from other fields. Like, I have a friend who's a vet, and she, there's a shortage of veterinarians right now in the US. And she's almost assured a job offer if she applies, like, anywhere. It's just a matter of finding a place that is, that she wants to work. Um, and she has, they got their own set of, because um, there's no vet boot camps though. The job. No, yeah, <laughs> you gotta get a, a veterinary degree. The, 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 hoop, like, the hoop you have to jump through is earlier, <laughs> yeah. right? You gotta get into a program, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, but all that to say, like, it, it just the expectations have to be aligned with whatever the reality is of the market. Yeah, and so. What was your sense of the market when you hit the hit the market in uh, fall of 2022? I mean, it was already kind of turning a little bit at that point, but maybe not full on yet. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, what was your experience at that at that time? And how did you end up getting a job in New York? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know that I personally noticed a huge difference in my experience versus what previous what i'd heard from previous cohorts and from what like metrics that you all tried to provide to us on our job hunt one thing i was also surprised but i shouldn't have been surprised but i will say like the level of support during the job hunt and just like the quantity of the resources you guys had available for us was really awesome and yeah I, it's good I to hear yeah we're we're all, we're like you know we're on you <laughs> yeah <laughs> we're, on, we're on you we got we got people around I up there a lot <laughs> every phase um so i think i had like yeah it was hard but it, it wasn't surprising me like it seemed to kind of align with what i'd heard um i ended up getting a job at new relic because kind of the stars aligned so um i'd worked with cali burachara as a ta in launch school and there ended up being a spot opening, not just on New Relic, but on her team. Um, so she referred me and she was really able to advocate for me. And that's eventually what, you know, where I ended up. And that was a good thing too, because at the time I had, um, I had a few other engagements. Like I was inter 
interviewing with two other companies and kind of at the same time that I got my offer, I got the rejections back from those companies. So oh, definitely okay. I, I was going to ask you why. <laughs> so what made you choose New Relic? But um, and, <laughs> I mean, other than Cali well, being there, I think that's good, you know, good sign. But what um, yeah. would you have chose? Do you think you would have chosen New Relic even if the, you had other offers coinciding with it? L- let's say the pay is roughly the same. Yeah. Honestly, yes. So I got a lot of good signals from New Relic. Uh, the first was that it came with a built-in Cali. And I yeah. spent time with her in law school, just knew she was a great person. And um, the and she was the host man, of this podcast a couple seasons yeah. ago. So <laughs> she's super fun. I'm curious. <laughs> You'll know why. Well, like having a built-in Cali is a, is a plus. <laughs> um, my manager was also very charismatic and really, um, really warm and welcoming. And I went into my goals for the job hunt were, um, like I was talking about boundaries before. I was going in, and my goal was like, I want to work at a place um, where I'm not overworked, and where there seems to be like a shot of making a lasting connection with my teammate. So really the people element was what was most important to me. I didn't really care what the tech stack was or what the product was. Okay. Like at all. Okay, sounds like, yeah, that sounds exactly it then. <laughs> yeah. And so my, my manager gave me a lot of great signals and the only downside for me is that it was a hundred percent remote. Mm. I had also gone in being like, I went hybrid. Um, Oh, you were looking for like a company in Austin going to the office. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. So you chose New Relic, um, got started there. And, you know, the audience for the Logical Podcast, uh, you know, is Logical students, right? And most of them are in core. Most of them do not know what New Relic is. So maybe if you could just like give an instruction of what the company is, what it does, um, give a high level indication of the size of the company. Cause sometimes when we talk about these things, it's like, is it, is it like 10 people? Is it 20 people? Is it 500 people? Like, yeah. is it 5,000 people? <laughs> <laughs> like how, what's the size of these things? Um, but like, what does it do first of all? And what problem does it solve for developers? Sure. Um, I'll preface this by saying like, I had to look all of this up before I interviewed because I didn't know what New Relic did either. Um, like, I think I knew it. The, Why do you want to work on New Relic? <laughs> You're like, uh, let me Google that. <laughs> uh, let me figure that out. Give me a second. Um, yeah, so New Relic is an observability company. And uh, I'll do my best simplified natural version of it. Um, but essentially, um, I'd say like most software companies um, that aren't someone's side project at the very beginning of their startup are um their product is running on many many machines like on the internet right and so when especially when there's a error in your system or a problem in your system that might be an actual error it might be a page is loading too slow or some other task in your program is loading too slowly it might be like your program is um, using too many, uh, too much compute on the the machine that it's running on. Like, there's all sorts of things that you could that you can define as as unacceptable for your your service. And all of those problems can happen on any one of a number. I mean, the scale is obviously depends on the company, but thousands, like tens of thousands of machines. And it can be very, very difficult to isolate those problems. So what New Relic does is it uh, provides agents, which are pieces of software that instrument your program to output additional data that then it can then ingest back to determine if any one of those problems that you have defined is occurring. Um, so, so New Relic so, customers are like very large deployments, like a like a Walmart. I'm not saying Walmart is or isn't, but something like that. Very big yeah. infrastructure, not not like one app. Yes, deployed. it's yeah. that would be overkill. For... So, so, super sophisticated infrastructure. And then the output of that is like um, we've got like dashboards that you can look at as an engineer. Um, 
to sort of monitor your systems in a visual way, or you can be notified if a problem you have to find as a problem has happened. You get a Slack message or yeah. an email or a page or something. I remember when New Relic started and it was just like a little plug in to your web app mm -hmm. and it was awesome. I used it for a long time. Yeah. And then I did you. somewhere along the way, I wasn't paying attention to it. And all of a sudden it was just like a gigantic company with huge. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> I used that thing oh. back in the day. And to answer your question about size, mm -hmm. uh, I did look into this because I wasn't sure the other day, but there's around 2,500 employees. Oh. And um, it's not simple, I guess, for me to figure out how many engineers we have, but it's somewhere between like 500 and 1,000, probably closer to the 1,000 and to the range. That's a so, lot of engineers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a huge product. Like there's, I mean, there is so much about it that I do not know, um, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, I mean, there's opportunities. It's to, a public company, right? Um, yes. Yeah. So at the moment, at the moment, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Pri private equity is stepping in, but um, yeah, but that's that gives us scale too, right? In terms of, uh, it, it this is sure. not you know a small thing when it's public. So you joined, as I said, in a job hunt, sort of when when things were kind of turning a little bit, and then um, of course earlier this year, January, February, March, first quarter, uh, layoffs were just all over tech, and yeah. it happened in New York too. Um, so there were layoffs at New Relic. Obviously, you you weren't impacted by um, by the layoffs, yeah. but wondering how you know from the outside you see the news. Um, but how 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 was it on the inside as a software engineer uh, at a company who did layoffs? Um, you know, kind of overall morale, overall you know day to day work. Uh, how 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 was that like post layoff environment? Yeah, I'd see the. I mean, it was a huge bummer. Like. A lot of they let go ten percent of the company. That's a lot. Um, <laughs> that's decimation so there. there. <laughs> yeah, literal decimation. Yeah. Um. So it was just, and we've got a we've got a channel, um, where people say it's called Aloha. They say hello and goodbye, like when they join or when they leave. And so that channel was just lighting up Man. with everyone saying goodbye, and it was very sad. <laughs> Um, I don't think anyone did any work that day. My team certainly didn't do any work that day. It was just so distracting and mm -hmm. definitely the mood, like at least for a good week or so, um, was very heavy, like in every meeting. It was just um just like didn't want to talk too much. I mean, they wanted to talk about it, they wanted to process it, but it wasn't like you don't want to do your usual chit chat. People just yeah, yeah. morale's really low. Yeah, for sure. Um, funny thing, and I had, um, I I wasn't like super anxious about getting laid off, but it was kind of it's kind of hard to ignore after a certain point. Like mm -hmm. it was just this is prior to the the, the layoffs, um, and at the moment my I was house hunting, <laughs> mm. so. Uh, I just one day, one day I'm like, you know what? I'm feeling a little paranoid. I'm just going to ask my manager, like, do I have any reason to to feel worried? Like, how am I doing? Um, and she told me, she's like, no, there's no reason. Like, I, I have no reason to believe that you should be worried. You're doing great. And that ended up being the day before the layoffs, like, just completely coincidentally. So looking Whoa. back, I was like, oh, did she think I somehow found out that this was going to happen? But it was a complete coincidence. Hmm. Um, and then that also made it feel kind of extra weird and surreal. Yeah, that, that that's a, like when you don't have a lot of financial obligations, it's not a big deal. I remember same thing. I, you know, I, I started my career in the middle of a recession, in the middle of layoffs. Um, you know, I didn't know it was normal, but I definitely didn't feel as panicked as some other people just because I didn't have any financial obligations. But once you have a house and mortgage and, you know, lots of dependencies on your salary, then it's it becomes absolutely life changing, right? If you were to get laid off. So I can see yeah. it. Um, so and as far as you individually, um, and I guess you weren't there for too long at that point, right? Not too long. So 
did you did you know what to do or did you just how did you react it like uh, individually or just focus on your work or yeah yeah i mean I, i'm the type of person that like i need a lot of time to process things individually before i can do it in a group setting and so i kind of just listened a lot to how other people felt and i tried to keep my head down yeah. and do my work for the most part and you're you're remote so it's kind of hard to detect I mean, you can definitely detect it. You know, people yeah. stop stop being cheery in 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 Slack, but in person, it's even more obvious, right? And oh, I can't imagine. Yeah, it must have been. Yeah, I, I I went through that and in Austin as well, actually, and just it it, it was just a, you can just see it in people's faces every day, which was which was uh, a, a little alarming, but um, but. Now you're on the other side of that. Um, Want to talk about your team or product that you're working on at New Relic? Um, what 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 is it? Um, it's a large, you know, uh, five hundred to a thousand software engineers, perhaps. Uh, big product. What are you working on? How many people are on your team? Um, and I have some follow up questions, but I'll just ask those two um, for now. So there are um, six people on my team. It's quite small. And. We are the engineering operations team, like you said. And so we, um, I'm not sure, like, as someone who who's has so much experience with, with what certain names <laughs> mean across tech, like whether it's a fitting name or not, but we work on internal tooling. So most of our customers are other New Relic employees. And specifically, like developers? we... Other New Relic yes. developers. Yeah, they're engineers. There's a few non-engineers who are also our customers, um, and that'll kind of make sense in a second. But um, specifically, we work on incident management tooling. So an incident is, it gets a little meta because we're an observability company, but anytime something goes wrong at New Relic, um, and it's, well, not any time, but... Hopefully, most of the time, something goes um, seriously wrong at New Relic. A engineer usually will open an incident, and they'll start kind of like they and other. They'll have help from other people. Will start sort of solving and investigating and finding out the cause of the problem and solving it out loud, like um, basically while marking. A lot of metadata about the incident, so that we're able. Like, give to me an example of a typical incident, just to just to paint that picture. Sure. Like a yeah, database so, goes down, or what? What do we? Yeah, that'd be a big deal. But yeah, let's say <laughs> a database comes down, or a maybe a single um, interaction from a service, maybe like a single request from a service to a database, is like twice as slow as it usually is. Okay. That'd be a minor incident, okay. but you know they can. I mean, the possibilities are endless, but let's say that happens. Um, so then you'll have an incident commander notice that they'll start an incident and we do a lot of this through Slack. So one of the, the tools that my team maintains is a Slack bot that just makes that like a little bit easier so that the engineer doesn't have to fill out a form. Mm -hmm. um, they can just kind of like type in Slack, like, hey, here's the status. 10 minutes later, here's the status. Oh, I, this is more serious than I thought. It's here's the status um and then we make other tools that help the engineers to express who the incident is impacting so there's kind of two sides it's like everything about the incident all the metadata that we can gather at the time or retroactively and then there is who is this affecting and how and so we have a different tool to help them input that information and that tool feeds into other tools which notify certain customers um that they're being impacted by an incident so um new relic being an observability company is very important to our customers that we're reliable so like if our systems are down we're not helping them to monitor their systems and so they understand that things happen things break but they just really want to know when that's happening so then they know okay we need to adjust the way 
we, maybe we need to bring in some engineers to manually monitor something that New Relic does automatically for us. Nice. So, so your your team. I mean, that sounds super critical. Like y- your 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 products cannot go down, right? Um, <laughs> as you said, it's very meta in that your 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 products are helping manage incidents. And so, do do, do does your team have like on call or or I mean, six is not that high of a number. I I don't think. Oh. So and there's like entire companies that do the same thing that yeah just our one does. So um it is critical but when if if a service of ours goes down um I think the expectation isn't for us to like in in me- like we're people, right? We're humans so we fix it as fast as six people can fix something. Yeah. Um but there's also manual processes that used to exist before they had these tools so that's kind of the fallback. Mm. Um, like they'll they'll input all the incident data manually, which is annoying, but gotcha. um, it means I don't have I wouldn't have to like stay up the whole night to fix something. You're you're in the you're right in the heart of the machinery. <laughs> you're <laughs> right in the middle of it. Sounds like a really incredible um work experience. Yeah. Like so I, I get this question a lot, which is especially when people in core, right? They're learning about like variable scope and they're, you know, trying to iterate through a, a list or array or something. And they're like, how do, like, how does this work <laughs> map to what Missy's talking about, right? In yeah. the heart of the machine. <laughs> um, like, Anything to do. <laughs> yeah, like, like bridge the gap for me. I'm learning about HTTP response codes and you're here talking about incidents and, and being a key, key part of a public company. Um, like, like that, that's, that's the first question, right? And second of all, like, who are the people that work there? I know you got Callie there, which is good. Um, yeah. but other people, like, do they all have like PhDs in computer science and there's you and Callie or, or like, can you hang with them? <laughs> can you hang with Callie? I'm, do you feel you like out of your element? Hang out with Callie or, oh, oh, okay. I know you hang, hang out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a question that I get a lot, right? I obviously know the answer you're doing oh, well, but yeah, I think the question is really asked from, the typical core student perspective in terms of like how I'm just speaking from a typical core student, which is like, how can I get that job? Right. How can I get a job like that? Are my colleagues going to like look down on me? How can I contribute positively in that environment? Are they all like computer science grads? Like who, who works at these places? Yeah. Um, I'll just start with who works there. So it's me and Callie and we're launch school grads. Callie's been there or Captain Grads, Callie's been there for about a year longer than I have. Um, there are two senior engineers on our team. One of them is also a career changer. Um, and she actually, this was totally coincidence, but she actually went through part of the launch school core curriculum. Yeah. And then she ended up getting a job while, like, while she was doing core. And then I think she, like, this she was like three years ago, really right? Involved. I know who you're talking about. Yeah. It must be because I think she's about hitting her three, yeah. four years at New Relic. And then our other senior engineer, um, he's he's um, he's a computer science graduate and he's older. Like he has um, teenage boys. I'm not sure how old he is, but he has a lot of experience. Like he's worked at one other company, um, at least one other company for a good 10 years or so. And I think he's been at New Relic for four and I'm not sure his history but um beyond that and then we have one new comp site grad and then we have one relatively new other code school grad so cal and i are actually like the Mm mid-level engineers on this we got three logical people there that's on your one six person it's so weird that is insane (laughs) i'm gonna claim that one too so i'm gonna claim that as a success too (laughs) wow that is incredible love love that love hearing that i didn't know that um i mean i knew i knew they were a new relic. I didn't know you were on the same team. No, it was, it was man. That's more. awesome. Well, to answer your question, um, like I definitely feel like, I definitely feel comfortable on my team. I feel like one of the, and I'm saying this after a year, like I haven't felt this way for six months, but at this point, I feel like one of the core contributors of the team. And I regularly, um, like mentor and help the earlier career engineers. Um, 
To answer your question about like how does your core experience map to your job experience, I'm trying. The short answer is like a resounding yes. It really, it's there. Like you use the foundations every day. You almost, you, it's like you don't notice that you're using them, and that's the best part about it. Almost so. Our tech stack is most, I'd say most of my work is with Node.js, so a lot of JavaScript. We have a few React frontends. So there's React, which is JavaScript based. Um, And then we have a couple of Rails apps. And actually just by comparison, like I feel very comfortable with JavaScript because of core. And so I don't ever have to solve that like, two-layer problem that we talk about. So I don't ever have to figure out what the heck JavaScript is doing while I'm figuring out the domain, the problem in the problem domain that I'm working in um, when I'm working in Node. When I'm working on the Rails app, it's extremely frustrating because I do not have a core fundamental level understanding of Rails. The Ruby really helps. I did the Ruby track and that, like, I, I would... It would be even more frustrating if I didn't have the Ruby. But I'm ha- it's, it's very frustrating to work in that app. And a lot of times I stop and I'm like, get some clarity, get some understanding, and then go back to the problem. Because it's just, it's just when you're solving a difficult problem and you're figuring out the technology at the same time, it's just swimming upstream in the extreme. Because you're so, debugging, right? You're... It's just, I think a lot of times when you're learning, it's just like, here's a tutorial that builds a blog. And you need levels of abstraction and scaffolding to quickly build that blog. But that's not what you're doing. You're debugging. You're now in the guts of it and saying, when this thing happens, there's a bug here. I need to go fix it. So you have to like know the specifics of that scaffolding, the specifics of the automated code that was generated that allowed you to build that blog in like 10 minutes. So yeah. it's totally different. You got to know what you're doing at and that point. You, most of the stuff, like almost nothing, I didn't write it. It was written like five years ago. And so I just have to hold, if you're debugging a particularly hard problem, you have to hold so many things in your working memory. Like, okay, I'm in this function call and what function called that function? Oh, that's right. So that's that's what's in scope and that function now mm-hmm. I passed it down to this function okay okay i think like i know where to start inserting some of my logging or i know to what start testing and if i'm like wondering whether the function should be async or not or i like don't really understand when the function call is happening at the same time that's just overloading my working memory you just break that chain right and yeah, and, and then you got to get You're, You're like, done. okay, now I got to remember the method calls again. Yeah, and just back and forth. And so, um, and same thing. Like if I'm like yesterday, I was I was trying to find. I was trying to understand the relationship between two tables in a database, um, and really understand like it was a database of an abstract thing, like a measure of uptime based on um, based on like a specific uh, product, like internal product, and it was regional at the same time. So I'm like, I have a vague understanding of what that is. And if I can just kind of like do a few joins and um, like poke around the database a little bit, then I'm good and I was good to go. And if I didn't know this, like if the SQL didn't just kind of come out of my fingertips without me having to think about it, I'd again get distracted like okay my measurement and i'm like what uh how do we do it like oh the where clause comes next it's just yeah extremely difficult i feel like um mastery of fundamentals you you notice it when you don't have it (laughs) and (laughs) and when you do have it you just you get stuck at higher level problems and that's where you need to be operating right so um that, that's a that's a really good observation. I'm glad you showed this, like, you're getting specific here, which is really good. And I think that is what early on people are missing, right? Because we put these things in front of people and I think people are like, how do I map this to that job? You know, I knew I like, all right, you know, a big, big tech company. What 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 is what I'm learning here really important? Is there a shortcut, right? And, and yeah. you're going to need it. No. You're going to need all this stuff. 
I think our our units on testing are very, very thorough and they kind of help you to, it's also the mindset too. Like I feel like law school just gets you to be thorough and patient and um, that's helped me find a lot of problems too. Like uh, last month I found a bug that had been, had existed in our system for like at least a year um, and it was a pretty deep-seated bug that would have led to customers not being notified on impact, which is like a big, big deal for us. Like in a certain case, it was, it was an edge case, but it was still a possibility. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was from, like, I felt like I was back in the unit testing module. I was like, okay, like write out all my test cases, like in English, write them all out and then figure out like all the combina- combinat Torix, is that the word? Um, of like everything I need to test, and that's how I found it, and it was it was a good thing. I hear that so much, so many times from our capstone grads, and just like I found this crazy bug that's been there for years and years. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like being methodical. I didn't believe it just for a while. That's I... it. That's <laughs> yeah. why after, now that you're on the other side, I feel like it's just when whenever anything works, you're like, that's amazing, <laughs> right? When things break, you're like, yeah, that's kind of normal. Yeah. That's normal. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> Got a couple more questions for you before we wrap up here, but I did want to talk about this because I saw a like a little uh, in in our in our alumni channel, which is like a little wins channel, and I saw uh, Callie post this, and she's like, "Missy and I worked on this at New Relic, um, and it, it seemed to be like something outside your normal responsibilities, and it it, it was a really interesting um, initiative you two did. I and and I was just like, do do you do you have that much time, extra time, or?" <laughs> <laughs> You want to talk about that a little bit? I, I, I didn't really um, fully get what it was, but it was really interesting to see that you, you, you're all doing like extra work. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened is kind of a funny story, but um, pretty much uh, every year, if we meet our like some quarterly or annual targets, New Relic will give us a week off in the summer. And so most of my team, I mean, everyone, like the whole company takes a week off, but there's usually like a spattering of people who are left who are on call. And Callie wanted to stay because she had like a family vacation later that she was going to take a week off for. So it didn't really make a whole lot of sense for her to develop on our like usually scheduled, regularly scheduled work on that week alone because like it's very collaborative and be very difficult for her. So she was like, hey, what if I convert one of our um, code bases into TypeScript. And the team was like, yeah, okay, that sounds cool. It seems like a good solo activity <laughs> for a week. Well, and week. then she, <laughs> and she uh, I think a, a staff engineer was like, Cal, are you sure about this? Like a week's kind of not a lot of time. And Cal is like, no, nah, I got this. <laughs> yeah. I got this. <laughs> so, Oh, so she converted all the code over to TypeScript. Um, and that apparently was not the hard part. So then a week later, everyone comes back. Callie's leaving for her vacation. And she messages me and she's like, hey, Missy, um, this is almost done. Like, can you just take care of <laughs> Famous last words. <laughs> just like, she's like, there's just like this error and maybe one other. And maybe they're masking some other errors. But like, you can probably clear it up. By the time I'm gone, she was dragging like, into yeah, this. Okay. <laughs> yeah. well, it, was, it was fun work. I was, I was happy too, and we're both like excited about. What, was it? Was it like like nights and weekends, or was it just like you had you you could set aside daytime to work on it? Okay, your manager was okay um, to just have you work on this. Yeah, they were okay. Like as I'm supposed to, like, listeners could probably figure out it took much longer than two weeks, but there were several points where we as a team were like, okay, is this worth spending our time on? Or should we call it a sunk cost and abandon it? Um, so yeah, I, I was like doing it along with some of my other tasks. And because of the time zone differences, I'm usually alone in the mornings anyway. So I'd like work on it in the mornings. It wasn't like my whole week on it. Mm-hmm. Um, but so yes, as as I'm sure the listener knows, Callie comes back and I'm like, yeah, I'm not done with this. Like we've got a few more days left. So like two months later, <laughs> um, the the really the hard part wasn't the TypeScript. It was getting the TypeScript to work with Docker and with our internal like 
homespun deployment mechanism. Um, and the, well, going back to the TypeScript, it was like the tests weren't converted, but the code was. So there was some custom configuration that you didn't see. We didn't see a lot. We had to. So you just have to like figure this out. And obviously nobody had done this before. So yeah, you, kind of you just had to like kind territory. of. Territory. Yeah. So, you, so, so that was the other. Right. Exactly. That, that was the hard part. It's like no one on our team could help us. Hmm. Um, like could help us without completely enmeshing them, themselves into the problem. Like there wasn't, none of the seniors could be like, oh yeah, I've seen that before. And at this point they were like, I don't know if this is like quicksand yarn. <laughs> I don't want to get yeah. in there or. <laughs> I'm sure they were like, these two, like they got themselves <laughs> in way too deep. I just maybe don't want to touch that. But we ended up getting like, and we ended up reaching outside of our team and having a really nice interaction with, um, uh, I, I can't remember, like someone who's who's very experienced in the company and was like an awesome teacher. Um, That's great. And so that was really fun too. Like it was just a very rewarding experience. Gives you an and excuse to just use the resources at your company, right? Just, yeah. I mean, there's awesome developers there. Why not talk to them? Yeah. And now we've got that relationship with him too. So yeah. it's that much easier. That's one thing I do really like about New Relic is that um, you feel very comfortable to ask people outside of your team for help. And so it's like, we just have another Another buddy now. Another buddy, that yeah. Helped with that with gnarly dog problems. That's that's what it's all about. I think people think that you go to work, you get tasks, you do it, and that's it. I mean, it's it's like the people at these companies are amazing. You gotta, but you gotta go seek them out, right? They're not gonna come yeah. and talk to you. I think it's similar to law school too. Like the community here is amazing, but you gotta go seek people out. And that's so true. You, you can't just sit back and I mean you can, but you're gonna get a limited experience, which is fine. But um, same thing about work. At work is exactly you want a remote job. You gotta you gotta be able to see people out. You gotta showcase work. You gotta have a reason to talk to people. I do want to ask yeah. this. I feel like this is a such an interesting case study, what you and Callie did, because this is not work that was given to you. This was not assigned to you. This is something you took on your own, on your own initiative. You figured it out. Obviously, I think I'm guessing you, you two got some reputation points for uh for getting this done. Um it reminds me of that chart well they where they talk about like at a junior level the problem is clear and the solution is clear and what you got to do the execution is clear and so you just got to do it the next level whatever senior or whatever then the problem is clear the solution is clear but the execution's unclear so you got to figure it out but you you you, you the, the, what you got it the problem and solutions are clear you got to reach that solution how not sure but it's clear and then you just kind of keep going out okay staff or principal it's like one more thing is unclear like the problem is clear, but the solution is unclear. And then obviously the execution is unclear because the solution is unclear. And then at the highest level, it's like everything's unclear. Everything's unclear. Everything's unclear right? Yeah. And so like as you move forward in your career and you progress and you want to progress and you want to get these like higher paying jobs, it's like the clarity decreases. And so you have yeah. sometimes you got to go find your own work. You have to then find the own solution and then you have to pave a path to that solution. And this is a prime example of where if you can do this, if you can operate in an unclear environment and find a problem and solve it, you're going to shine, right? And not just wait for work to be given to you. Yeah, absolutely. I think that goes back to what we were talking about of even like, I know there's, there's some parts, there's some parts that are very difficult to teach and probably like a lot of, I mean, law school is, is made up of so many career changers, right? And mm -hmm. so if you have that skill from your other job of like identifying problems and fixing them, it's totally going to carry over. But I will say one thing that comes from launch school is like getting certainly used to and almost comfortable with hard problems and with fuzziness and just like having the sometimes it feels like courage to go in and be like okay let me let me open my mouth and give my best attempt at describing this so that someone can correct me and having that courage to go in and like find the clarity 
um, or even just sit with the unclarity. Like there's so many meetings I would sit in when I first started that were just Greek to me. But I just, I, I forced myself to keep listening because I was like, this is, this is what, uh, you know, we were trained to do over and over again is take the thing that's, that's fuzzy and intimidating and just like tease it apart until it's not. And then that opens up a larger level of bigger fuzzy things that you can tease apart. Yes, that's, that's the key. I mean, if I were to take a clip from this podcast, at least so far, this will be it, what you just said. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, uh, people zone in on the wrong things all the time. Do you have to have a degree, right? Am I too old or too young or whatever? <laughs> it's like, what you just said is it. It's just not being afraid, having the courage to look at a problem and tease it apart. Try to tease it apart. And when you reach a part where you can't, you're missing some fundamental knowledge. Take a step back. Go get that fundamental knowledge, right? Or enough so that you can continue down this path of teasing this problem apart and um that that's all that's all it is that's all it is that we do i mean it's 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 hard and it's as easy as that right so if you find this process hard then it's hard if you find this piece process natural then it's then it's more natural but either way we got to do it um yeah and i think logical too we give you a lot of these like oh this 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 problem is like said in a crazy way right just like crypto you're like whoa it's cryptography (laughs) and then you really look at it it's like okay it's not (laughs) It's not that bad, <laughs> you know. It's like a cipher yeah. involved, um, and yeah. so much of work is like that. It's worded pretty severely, but once you tease it apart, you're like, okay, this just means this. This just means this, and I'll just take it apart mm-hmm. one at a time. I know we're going okay. long here. Yeah, that long. Give, give us a quick like day to day, like uh, oh yeah, because re- remote work is hard. Missy wakes up at, I guess okay. nine, <laughs> <laughs> and. And then does what? Yeah. So I actually wake up closer to like eight o'clock. Okay. <laughs> um, and then I have coffee first thing in the morning. Um, and I start work at 10. So I spend from eight to 10. I do something that does not involve a computer. Um, that's like quiet and reflective by myself. Like I paint or I draw or write or work in the garden. Um, Wait, on a this is a work day. This is a work day. Oh yeah. wow, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not like always very productive, but I just the ritual is like I'm alone, it's quiet, I'm not looking at a screen. Um, and I'm doing something like one of the other things that matters to me besides my career. Yeah. And then I walk to this little home office here, <laughs> um, from somewhere in the house. And I've got usually the morning to myself, which I really like from 10 to about noon my time because most of my colleagues are on Pacific time. Ah, yes, you're two hours ahead. Yeah, I I really like it. But we have stand up at noon my time, which is 10 their time. It's either stand up or like a longer team meeting. And my team works in squads. So our stand ups are actually pretty pretty quick because they're small. They're like two or three of us usually and then there will be like i don't know maybe three hours where there's like one other meeting or it's heads down time we'll usually have another meeting after the portland folks have lunch which is my two to three and then around like Four o'clock my time, I usually have from four to six heads down time as well. So I can get into what I'm doing in those chunks. But then I'm off work at six and I don't, again, usually don't use a computer from six to how, about eight or nine o'clock. In the that, yeah, that's about. awesome. And how, how much time do you think in your day you spend coding? <laughs> um, maybe like an hour if i'm lucky what yeah (laughs) so i i think this is um in some of the other podcast recordings i've been asking people this question and it's always low it's always low yeah and i think people are surprised by that like writing code yeah like just i I think you know like first of all i agree with you (laughs) that's that's my experience too when i was working um 
uh, you know, usually one to if I have like four hours of coding a day, I'd be like, wow, that was super That'd productive. Be amazing. Yeah, that was like yeah. an amazingly uh, focused day, right? Yeah. Um, but I think people in core and capstone don't realize that like the work is problem solving and problem solving mm -hmm. is communicating with develop other people <laughs> right that's yeah. you're, you're figuring out the problem and you're trying to know what code to write yep. and typing out the code is like that's the easy that's the last part it's pdac <laughs> right yeah it's yeah you're, you're doing the first I'll part of pdac right. at work all day every day with communicating stand-ups and things like that mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I spend like a lot of time on Slack. I spend a fair time writing like in a Google doc or we use Confluence um, or just like talking to people in meetings or just I'll, I'll like sit down and be writing out notes to like solutions to things. I spend a good amount of time um, debugging and actually I do use New Relic to debug too. So yeah. I'll, sometimes I'll be oh, or reading like some a lot of reading documentation, um, internal or external documentation. Oh, and sometimes I like I do spend. I'd love to be better about it, and I know, but I do sometimes like take an hour to myself just to learn, like just to learn a little bit of Docker or learn a little bit of Rails, um, or I'll attend like a tech talk we have. Yeah. That's what I call like just-in-time learning, right? You 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 got to do that too. Um, it's not mastery yeah. based anymore, but you, you got to time no. box it at that point. <laughs> um, uh, so and that that is, I think that is what um a lot of people miss, and like career changers too. It's like that's an advantage if you come from a career where you already know how to like you you understand yeah, that's the work. Yeah. Then you're gonna thrive in 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 this type of environment, right? Um. But if you think it's just sitting there, and I think this is like, I mentioned this in the other episode too, like people get too caught up in the AI stuff that because they can pump out code and just like, oh mm -hmm. no, you can pump out code. What am I going to do? It's like, great. Like, you can code even less. <laughs> you know, figure out what to do. And then, pump, and then the code's given to you. Then, then, then you have more time to do the other work, right? Yeah. Like if the AI could have all the meetings and write all the Slack messages and write all my notes, then I'd be intimidated, but... Then you can paint all day. Yeah. <laughs> well, there'd be other problems. There'd be other problems, <laughs> yeah. There's always problems. There's higher and higher level problems to solve um, as yeah. humans. I mean, ultimately, I think the profession is solving... Our profession is... it. It's a, it's a human profession. It, yeah. It, it's about Absolutely. solving human problems. Um, and, and code is a tool to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I think people get too caught up in like, we're code generators. Um, you have to know how code is generated. You have to know the details of it in order to fix it. But I, I don't think the job is generating code. Yeah. So, yeah. Because that's like one way or another, the software you're writing is a mapping of reality, like some representation yeah. at some level of human. Yeah, reality sure. is full of human problems. Yeah. Um, so, um, we'll end it, we'll end it with one last question. Uh, what do you appreciate most about your current team and a new relic as a company? So I'd say I got what I was looking for. Like I'm on a team that really prioritizes connection with each other um, and is very very focused on work-life balance um so i'm i feel really like safe and able to extend those firm boundaries that i was talking about and i love that um and then what i mentioned before like we have not only do you feel comfortable to reach out for help from someone that's not off your team or someone who's like higher than you but it, it's um it's sort of built into the organization of our company. Like every team has a help channel. So there is a like trodden path for you to ask for that help too. So the whole company is just like always learning from each other. Um, and then what I also mentioned about there being opportunities to learn and grow. So there's right now there's a tech talk series going on every Friday morning 
Um, and there are communities of practice. I'm not sure if that's a that's a common thing. Term. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is my first corporate job too. COP. <laughs> just my first <laughs> software job. Yeah. So we have um, like I I like to go to the reliability COP meetings. And they'll just talk about whatever the topic is. There's a Ruby COP and mm. they'll just kind of like geek out and have presenters. That's great. Um, present cool topics. So it's, yeah. It's like, it's like, it's a, a good place to work. It's like leaving law school going into, I mean, that's, 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 uh, I, I love that the, there's so much focus on learning and growth and supporting each other. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. well, thanks for stopping by. Uh, it was a wonderful conversation. Thank, we're winning way over time and thanks for sticking with it. Um, <laughs> Super, super interesting. Glad, glad, glad you were able to come on. Absolutely. I really enjoyed myself. Thanks, Chris. Thanks.